Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov Chapter 5 Continued In the next dream, Oblomov saw himself a boy of thirteen or fourteen. By this time, he was going to school at the village of Rklevo, five versts from Oblomovka, where an old German named Stoltz kept a small educational establishment for the sons of neighboring gentry. Stoltz had a son of his own, one Andre, a boy almost of the same age of Oblomov. While, likewise, he had been given charge of a boy who did few lessons for the reasons that he suffered from scrofula and was accustomed to spend most of his days with his eyes and ears bandaged and weeping quietly because he was not living with his grandmother, but rather in a strange house and amid hard-hearted folk who never petted him or baked him his favorite pies. These three boys constituted the only pupils. As for the tutor himself, he was both capable and strict, like most Germans. Wherefore, Oblomov might have received a good education had Oblomov stood five hundred versts from Verklevo. As it was, the atmosphere, the mode of life, and the customs of Oblomovka extended also to Verklevo, and the one place represented a sort of replica of the other, until only old Stoltz's establishment stood clear of the primordial mist of laziness, of simplicity of morals, of inertia, and of immobility for which Oblomovka was distinguished. With the scenes, the incidents, and the morals of that mode of life, young Oblomov's mind and heart had become saturated before even he had seen his first book. Who knows how early the growth of the intellectual germ in the youthful brain begins? Can we, in that youthful consciousness, follow the growth of first impressions and ideas? Possibly, even before a child has learnt to speak, or even to walk, or even to do more than look at things with the dumb, fixed gaze which his elders call dull, it has already discerned and envisaged the meaning, the interconnection of such phenomena as encompass its sphere, and that though the child is still powerless to communicate the fact, whether to itself or to others. Thus, for a long time past, young Oblomov may have remarked and understood what was being said and done in his presence. For a long time past, he may have understood why his father, in plush breeches and a wadded cinnamon-colored coat, walked to and fro with his hands behind his back, and took snuff and sneezed, while his mother passed from coffee to tea, and from tea to dinner in the daily round, and his father always refused to believe how many sheaves had been cut and reaped, but was forever looking out for derelictions of duty, and, a handkerchief in his hand, holding forth on the subject of irregularities, and turning the whole place upside down. Briefly, for a long time past, the boy may have decided in his mind that that, and no other, order of life was the right one. For how else could he have decided? In what manner did the grown-ups of Oblomovka live? God only knows whether they ever asked themselves for what purpose life had been given them. Did they, at all events, return themselves any answer to that question? No, no answer at all, since the whole thing seemed to them at once simple and clear. Had they, then, never heard of a hard life wherein people walk with anxious hearts and roam the face of the earth and devote their existence to everlasting toil? No, the good folk of Oblomovka had no belief in disturbing the mind. They never adopted as their mode of life a round of ceaseless aspirations some wither and towards an indefinite end. In fact, they feared the distraction of passion as they did fire, and as, in other spheres, men's and women's bodies burn with the volcanic violence of inward and spiritual flame, so the souls of the denizens of Oblomovka lay plunged in an undisturbed inertia which possessed their ease-loving organisms to the core. Consequently, life did not stamp them, as it stamped others, with premature wrinkles, nor did it deal out to them any morally destructive blows or misfortunes. These good-humored folk looked upon life as, rather, an idol of peace and inactivity, though an idol occasionally broken by such untoward incidents as sickness, losses, quarrels, and rare bouts of labor. 
That labor they endured as a punishment formerly imposed upon their forefathers also. Yet they never loved it, and invariably escaped its incidents whenever they found it possible so to do. Such an avoidance they considered permissible, for never did they worry themselves with vague moral or intellectual questions. In this manner they flourished in constant health and cheerfulness, for which reason most of them lived to a green old age. Men of forty would look like youths, and old men, instead of battling with the approach of a hard and painful end, lived to the utmost possible limit, and then died, as it were, unawares, and with a gentle chilling of the frame, and an imperceptible drawing of the closing breath. No wonder that in these days folks say that the people used to be more robust. Yes, it was more robust, for the reason that in those days parents did not hurry to explain to a boy the meaning of life, and to prepare him for life as for something at once difficult and solemn. No, they did not weary a child with books which would cloud his head with questions likely to devour the heart and the intellect, and to shorten existence. Rather, the standard of life was furnished him and taught him by parents who had received it ready-made from their parents, together with a testamentary injunction to preserve the integrity, the inviability of that standard as they would have done that of the Vestal Flame. As things were done in the time of Oblomovkin fathers and grandfathers, so were they done in the time of the present Oblomov's tenure of the estate. Of what needed he to think? Concerning what needed he to trouble his head? What needed he to learn? What ends needed he to compass? The Oblomovs required nothing. Their life flowed like a peaceful river, and all that they had to do was to sit on the bank of that river and to observe the inevitable phenomena which, successively and unsought, presented themselves to the eyes of each observer. Before the vision of the sleeping Oblomov, there next uprose a series of living pictures of the three chief acts of Oblomovkin life, as played in the presence of his family, of his relatives, and of his friends, namely the three acts of birth, of marriage, and of death. This was succeeded by a varied procession of minor incidents of life, whether grave or gay, of baptisms, birthdays, family festivals, shrove tides, Easter's, convivial feasts, family gatherings, welcomes, farewells, and occasions of official congratulation or condolence. These passed before Oblomov's vision with solemn exactitude, and also he beheld the bearing of familiar faces at these ceremonies, according as they were affected by vanity or by care. No matter what the festival might be, whether a betrothal or a solemn wedding or a name day, every possible social rule had to be consulted, and no mistake made as to where each person was to sit, what presence and to what value ought to be given, who was to walk with whom at the ceremony, and what signals had best be made during its course. Do you think, then, that goodly children would not result from such formal unitings? For answer, you would need but to look at the rosy, heavy little cupids which the mothers of the place carried or led by the hand. Every one of those mothers would have insisted that their little ones were the plumpest, the whitest, and the healthiest children possible. Another local custom was to make a lark pie as soon as spring came in. Without it, spring would not have been spring at all for observances of this kind comprise the whole life, the whole scientific knowledge of the inhabitants, all of whose joys and sorrows were bound up with Oblomovka, and whose hearts beat high at the anticipation of such local rites and feasts and ceremonies. Yet no sooner had they christened, married, or buried an individual than they forgot both the latter and his or her fate, and relapsed into their usual apathy until aroused by a new occasion, by a baptism, a wedding, or other happening of the kind. Directly a child was born, the parents made it their first care to perform over the little one every ceremony prescribed by decorum, and then to follow up the christening with a banquet. 
Thereafter, the child's bringing up began according to a system dictated by the mother and the nurse for his healthy development, and for his protection from cold, from the evil eye, and from sundry other inimical influences. Indeed, no pains were spared to keep the youngster in good appetite and spirits. Also, as soon as he was able to fend for himself, and a nurse had become a superfluity, his mother would be seized with a desire to procure for him a helpmeet as strong and as ruddy as himself, whereupon there would ensue a further epoch of rites and feastings, until eventually a marriage had been arranged. Always this consummation represented the epitome of life's incidents, and as soon as it was reached there began a repetition of births, rites, and banquets, until finally a funeral ceremony interrupted the festivities, though not for long, since other faces would appear to succeed the old ones, and children would become youths and maidens, and plight their troth to one another, and marry one another, and produce individuals similar to themselves. Thus life stretched out in a continuous, uniform chain which broke off imperceptibly only when the tomb had been reached. True, there were times when other cares overtook the good folk of Oblomovka, but always they faced the situation with stoical immobility, and the said cares, after circling over their heads, flew away like birds which, having sought to cling to a smooth, perpendicular wall, find that they are fluttering their wings in vain against the stubborn stone, and therefore spread those pinions and depart. For instance, on one occasion a portion of the gallery around the house fell upon and buried under its ruins a hen coop full of poultry, as well as, in doing so, narrowly missed a serving woman who happened to be sitting near the spot with her husband. At once the establishment was in an uproar. Every one came running to the scene, under the impression that not only the hencoop, but also the Berinya and little Ilya were lying under the debris. Every one held up his or her hands in horror, and fell to blaming everyone else for not having foreseen the catastrophe. Every one expressed surprise that the gallery had fallen, and also surprised that it had not fallen long ago. Upon that, there ensued a clamor and a discussion as to how things could best be put right. After which, with sighs of regret for the poultry, the company slowly dispersed, while strictly forbidding little Ilya to approach the ruins. Three weeks later, Andrushka, Petrushka, and Vasika were ordered to chop the planks and the remainder of the balustrade in pieces, and then to remove the fragments to the outbuildings, lest the road should become obstructed, and in the outbuildings those fragments tossed about until the following spring. Every time that the elder Oblomov saw them from the window, he fell to thinking what had best be done with them. Summoning the carpenter, he took counsel with the man as to whether he had better build a new gallery or pull down what was left of the old one. Until finally he dismissed his subordinate with the words, Do you wait a little until I have considered the matter further? The same thing went on until, one day, either Vasika or Motika reported to the baron that that morning, while he, Vasika or Motika, had been climbing over the remains of the old gallery, the corners of it had come away from the walls, and more of the structure had fallen, whereupon the carpenter was summoned to a final consultation, and the upshot was that some of the old fragments were used to prop the remaining portions of the gallery. Sure enough, by the close of the month, this had been done. Aye, that gallery looks as good as new, the old man said to his wife. See how splendidly Thedot has re-erected the beams. They resemble the pillars which the governor has just had fitted to his house. The job has been well done and will last for a long time. Here someone reminded him that it would be as well also to have the gates rehung and the veranda repaired, since the holes in the steps to the ladder were affording access not only to the cats, but also to the pigs. Yes, yes, it ought to be done, said the baron thoughtfully. Then he went out to look at the veranda. Yes, certainly the thing is breaking up, he continued as he seesawed one of the planks like a cradle. They have been loose ever since the veranda was made, someone remarked. 
How so? asked the Baron. They are loose only because the floor has not been mended for sixteen years. It was done then by Luca. He was a carpenter, if you like. Now he is dead, may God rest his soul. Workmen are not as clever as they used to be. They merely spoil things. From that, old Oblomov turned his attention to something else, and to this day, so report has it, the veranda is rickety, though not actually fallen to pieces. Certainly Luca must have been a good workman. However, to do the master and the mistress justice, they were capable of being shaken out of their apathy, even to the point of growing angry and heated, should any failure or misfortune occur. How, they would inquire, could such and such a matter have come to be overlooked or neglected? At once, due measures must be taken. Perhaps this would be relative to the fact that the footbridge over the moat needed mending, or that the garden fence called for repairs at a spot where the planking was lying flat upon the ground and allowing the cattle to enter and spoil the shrubs. Indeed, so solicitous was the baron for his property that once, when walking in the garden, he, with his own hands and with many grunts and groans, lifted up a length of fencing and ordered the gardener to fix a couple of props to the same. And to this activity on the part of the proprietor was due the fact that the said fence remained upright during the whole of the remainder of the summer until once more a winter snowstorm laid it low. Also, when Antip, with his horse and water cart, fell through the bridge into the moat, three new planks were inserted into the structure. Indeed, Antip had not recovered from his bruising before the bridge was looking almost as good as new. And even when the garden fence collapsed a second time, the cows and the goats did not reap very much advantage from the event. True, they managed to devour a few currant bushes, and also to strip a dozen lime trees, but before they could begin also upon the apple trees, an order was issued that the fence should be properly dug in and re-ditched. But this was only after two cows and a goat had been caught red-handed. You should have seen the distension of their stomachs with the generous fare. <laughs>